Okay, hello everyone. Uh, we can start the new session. I was asked uh, to be the chairman of, of this session, so it's a pleasure to, to start with uh, Bob for 25 minute presentation. Okay. So, thank you very much to the Iron, Iron ICMNS uh, working group uh, for allowing me to present here today, and I apologize for uh, some technical difficulties, but the star up there, uh, and Emanuela fixed it. So, this is Ultra, a simple, quick, and repeatable demonstration of the Lena process, in my opinion. Uh, and I have this question is, how can this happen? Okay, so um, the question, the question is, is, how does that, that jump, jump so high? high? And, and I, think I think they did some research, research on this in the US, US and they found that they couldn't actually explain with standard hydrodynamics how you got these things jumping way, way, way out of the water. Okay, uh, so this is my plan. Speak as fast as I need to uh, to get through the slides. Completely ignore interruptions and take questions at the coffee break, which was in the past, so I'm not even going to take the questions. <laughs> Right. So, what is the troidal moment? Did anyone find out? In no. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so, uh, the hypothesis I aim to describe is that self-organized, sound-initiated resonant yin-yang structures leads to fractal toroidal moments and vortical matter flow, which captures dark matter, focusing it to a point through which the other matter flows. And this leads to weak interactions, fusion, fission, transmutation, and coherent matter phenomena, including matter collapse and rebirth, collectively matter transformation. Okay, so this was the indium foil that was exposed for about, what was it, George? I think about 10 minutes. Yeah, it, in the Amasa vibrator. There were several features on this, but this is quite striking because of the arrangement. This is the morphology, uh, the fact that you've got glassy carbon and, uh, and a whole range of elements. I won't go into it, but hold that image in your mind, and if you can, flip it in your head. Um, so this is exposed to the Amasa vibrator. Here are the elements on there, but we're not going to focus on that. Um, but what happened was, we had some control indium, and Alan uh, took the initiative to clean it before we examined it under his SEM in California. And he gave it to me, and I think, oh, you cleaned it? Oh, okay, all right. So I put it on the SEM, and this is what I found, these huge craters. Literally, I turned on the SEM, and that's the first image that came up. And I thought, well, this is interesting. Should we have a look at those craters? And uh, I just, I've got a line scan here, I won't dwell on it, but essentially you've got carbon coming up, and then you've got the, uh, well, I don't know what the colors are on here, silicon coming up, and then the oxygen, and obviously carbon and oxygen fused the silicon. No, I can't. Um, so this is the experiment, ultra, and you, now I've got 25 minutes, I need to speak, otherwise I'll stop before I get to the end. Please, no interruptions. You can watch it on YouTube later at half speed, as many times as you don't like. Right, right. So, so <laughs> ultra experiment here. Um, these are the components you need. Uh, you need to be at least, I would suggest, five years old to get the maximum out of it. And it takes about uh, three or four minutes of instruction. And I will skip this. You can look at that video in your own time and other time. Okay, okay, so, so the, first the first person to replicate, replicate having, having presented this possibility, possibility first, first at Madison, Madison Wisconsin, Wisconsin University, University, and then and three days later here, here in my poster session at ICCF 22 in 2019, was Alan Cusk. And what I said was, don't use indium, use some other metal foil. And I didn't want to do anything, I just wanted someone to try it somewhere. And five, six months later, this guy tried his kitchen foil in his house. And he and saw he these saw striking features, features, these not regularly array, um, um, pits, pits and troughs. And this is the capability of his microscope. And, and also these tracks. tracks. So, well, I thought well, that's interesting. interesting. And, and so, so I did a lot, lot of uh, experimentation with various high speed cameras, cameras and so forth, found that in extremely num short numbers of cycles, just like you saw with that Tibetan singing bowl, you get these yin yang structures forming. And uh, the key thing is here is down the bottom, you see when I turn off the sound, 
in, in you've got like this, this is the black is hole, hole and this is the the white bit on the yin yang it's exactly that proportion you get a you toroidal, get a toroidal bubble, bubble and then it just lifts off it's it's, it's it's you know lighter, lighter than the water <laughs> Okay. okay, so, so that, that is kind of spinning around. around. There's, There's lots and lots and lots of videos, videos of the toroidal, toroidal things spinning, spinning around, around and all the action you might expect in there. there. Um, um, but, but David Boutier, after, after I shared a huge, huge number of uh, experiments, experiments in Canada, Canada he, replicated he replicated this and he just and he decided, decided after running it for a little time to put a magnet in there and see if what would happen. Well, he started to see all these flecks picking up on the magnet. Now, this is interesting because it was only the peaks and troughs. It was only, well, you don't know because it's upside down, it's the same thing. But anyway, anyway, it was only the peaks. So he, so put, he that put that under the microscope, microscope saw a little hole, hole in it, like you saw in Alan Cusk's work. So I so thought, I well, well uh, I think I know what that is, because if the aluminium's become magnetic enough to be picked up by that, maybe it's these magnetic charges that, that, that were observed in cavitation systems with, with people in Russia, and it's, it's focusing on that central point. And if that's the case, I then spoke to Alan. I said, you've got the tran uh, ultrasonic system. You have an SEM. Please go and get an eight whatever it was, thickness, the thickest aluminium foil you can get, and he got 85 micron or something from his local hardware store. Put it on there, he ran it for 18 minutes, and he put the mag around, and uh, before we go there, shoulders Matsumoto at, uh, say that uh, uh, exotic, exotic vacuum, vacuum objects with the same family of, of ball lightning as ball lightning. They could, they could transmit, transmit elements with ease and take and the form of torrids and spheres. And spheres. Matsumoto, Matsumoto said from, said from 1993, 1993 that his ionic clusters, clusters were equivalent to micro ball lightning, lightning and could, and could transmit, transmit matter as well as, well as uh, lead to the complete decay of and regeneration of matter into common elements such as carbon, oxygen, iron. They could take the form of torrids and spheres. We replicated replicate nearly every, every one, one of those observations, observations by those two parties. parties. Before, Before I was aware, I was aware of the second party, I was aware of the first one before many of the replications. So, so um, um, here's some natural that phenomena. That the one on the, the one right, right is a ball lightning impact in Hestalen in Norway, and that is an iron rich crenelated sphere they recovered from the impact site. On the right, you've got supposedly 2.7 billion year old micrometeorites. Look at them. Digest that. I don't believe that right thing anyway. But this is in me 356's tungsten rod electric discharge in potassium carbonate like water uh, in an alumina chamber. He produced that in 2016. And whilst it's much, much bigger, you can see the scale that's 10 microns over there. This is 200 microns. This is in George Eadley's dusty fusion reactor. And again, it's a crenelated microsphere. Okay. This is what happened. I said to Alan, I said, please do this experiment. And I predict exactly. You will, you will see, see iron-rich crenelated microspheres. That, that is an extremely precise prediction. prediction. So he so went he away went after three after days, because he had to get his things, things together, he was doing, doing some other things, things. and he came he back, came and, back and, and he produced many of them, them. using that, using that uh, uh, 85 uh, micron uh, foil uh, and uh, 18 uh, minutes uh, of ex exposure to the same device that I was showing out yesterday. And what you see is carbon and oxygen, and then you see these, these, these usual suspects here, and on the outside you get silicon and, and iron oxides, and it's actually encased in this encrustation that follows around the outside. Also, you'll notice that these sections are sometimes triangular, and it has this completely glassy, but this is a broken one, they're hollow, they're hollow. And it has and a crenellation there, okay? okay? Now, hollow uh, uh, things, things are what was observed by Solin in, in his uh, quantum uh, nuclear uh, synthesis uh, generator in 1992. 1992. It's also it's what is observed by Klimov. Klimov. He observes all of these hollow structures. structures. We've synthesized them in copper in the crystal grain boundaries. Grain boundaries, you can watch them grow, and, and so on. And it spews out carbon, mostly. And that's the front cover of Matsumoto's book. The nuclear reactions, according to Solin and Matsumoto, occur inside the spheres, or the, the complete decay of matter. So, so this, this is Bin Zhuen Huang at uh, uh, New Energy Center uh, uh, in Taipei. He chose he copper. copper. And it's, and it's almost, almost like, like you cannot you fail. fail. In, fact, in fact, I don't, I don't know, know anyone that's tried this experiment, experiment and failed. And failed. So, so if you want to be the first, first I'll be I'll glad, glad to hear it. it. <laughs> okay? okay? Now the now thing is, it produces this circular section in the center, and the two arms and a bar galaxy. And, and in, in free, free water, water, you see exactly the structure of the, the phantom, phantom galaxy, galaxy from the James, James Webb telescope. telescope. Exactly. exactly. 
Um, um, here, here, what you typically what get, get, what we what found, we found, I'm not going to go through the data, data you'll be pleased to know, know is sometimes is lighter elements and heavier elements, elements on, depending, depending on whether you're on the yin and the yang. Okay. Oh, you don't oh, want to watch that. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay, this, so is, this another is another researcher. researcher. It's um, um, a different, different frequency, 25 kilohertz, ours is 43 kilohertz, the ones that we've been doing. But I believe what we're seeing is that, is the center of that and that. And from, and from a 90, 90 degree, degree uh, perpendicularly, you get a vortex, vortex coming, coming out there and a vortex coming out, coming out there. there. Okay? okay? And this and is this one is like yin-yang yin pair. pair. Okay? okay. Uh, the, structure the structure on the right, on the right if you rotate, you rotate that, that, flip that, it, and, and, and don't do any do scaling any or distortion, distortion, it fits exactly the center of the, uh, 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 the galaxy. galaxy. And this is like Bostick said, these structures are the same as above, so below. So, so this system, this system here, here is a piezo transducer, an uh, ultrasonic horn, horn, a flat a hard plate. plate. Uh, it's uh, in air, and there's an there's organic, organic compound, compound in there. In there. Won't go we'll into go it, it'll be in the paper. paper. And it, 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 it organizes on the node, node but note, note, there is, there a, is separation a separation to two spots around, around the node. node. That is what's happening in the reactor. So we're looking at a standing wave vertically. So when we do the experiment, we have a plastic plate, the aluminium foil, and it's so self-organizing. The foil moves into the node, so you cannot fail. I mean, you literally have to desperately not want to, this to work. Okay, so, shoulders again on how EVOs may work. When seeking a physical an analogy for the driving force behind this process, which always occurs uh, to produce a black EVO state, in the absence of disturbance, a pressure analogy can be evoked. A driving force is seen to occur between the higher pressure side of our white universe, that's where you and I live, and the other black universe residing in an effectively lower pressure region of space. It might it even might be appropriate to sig signify that the black, black universe, universe identified here as the much touted dark matter region, region which, which is said, said to dominate in quantity over our normal matter. matter. I only, I only read, read that, that quote because it's in a book, in a book. two days ago. But the presentation the was basically was done, done on that basis. basis. But this but is Shoulders. I didn't know he'd said that. So this is my uber crummy sketch. Basically, Basically, when you, when you, when you'll, when see, you'll it, see it, you have a you toroidal, have a toroidal moment, moment here. here. A, 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 a solitron will move this way, way and the solitron moves that way. way. It creates it what looks like a first and third harmonic, third harmonic combination, combination shape. shape. Um, um, and the toroidal and moment goes out here, here and it maximally produces a cone of the golden ratio. And we've got this on many, many, many different experiments and different systems. The dark matter comes in here because they are toroidal. They can be interacted with the toroidal moment, not by electromagnetism. It comes in here, but if you notice, this is going around here. The flux of water or the contaminations or the things you want to transmute come through the other way, and they meet in this central point. So, so cavitation heat generator. I'm just going to do a little bit of history here. Cavitation was done in 1980 by Kladov, right? Two to seven times in his cavitation system, excess heat. Uh, the response uh, the of the Russian, Russian community, community was ridiculed. Really cool. uh, uh, cavitation, cavitation destruction of matter from, from his 1997 to 2002, 2002 work, work. Uh, uh, he uh, established, established that, that there appeared to be changing, changing, changing structure of nuclei, nuclei adding one or more structural elements, elements changing, changing structure of nuclei, nuclei dividing, dividing into several fragments, fragments and changing the structure of the nuclei dividing, dividing into the smallest structural fragments by complete transformation of the matter into radiation field forms of matter, talking complete collapse of the matter. So, so this is the, is the apparatus, apparatus. I don't, don't want to go, go in this, this but, but he remediated cesium-137. Uh, 20-hour uh, 20 hour treatment, treatment reduction of 65.1%. So, so uh, the cavitation, cavitation destruction of matter, matter. Uh, uh, you can go and look at the tables in your own time, but basically 19 elements after 2 hours, 23 elements after 8 hours, 29 elements, and so on. So it splits things, and then it reorganizes it. The yin-yang is the great leveler in this system. And by the and way, it happens in, 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 in Park and Bonds reactor, it's an HHO, the same, same thing. thing. So the Russian, the Russian uh, response was more ridicule. ridicule. And, and then, then uh, talk, uh, about talk about this about vortex, vortex tube, tube, the rank Hilton vortex, vortex tube. tube. Uh, uh, it, it, this is just, just from Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Basically, Basically, the vortex goes in and out the other way, and the dynamics of it has a soliton there. Okay? And you get hot gas coming out one way and really cold gas coming out the other. Oh, great. What happened there? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. okay. 
So, uh, so uh, vortex heat generators, the, the first person in Russia to try doing this vortex heat generator, not in the gas, which is compressible, but in, in water, which is not basically much compressible, um, was Alexander Merklov, and he found actually they did get excess heat and it was more than 100%. They thought, that's crazy. So, so despite, despite no one, no one knowing, knowing how these really work, work these water these versions, uh, devices, uh, devices using the principle, the principle called vortex, vortex heat generators are produced by around 20 organizations. There's many patents of different variations in Russia, Russia Ukraine, Ukraine, Lithuania, and, and Moldova. Moldova. So, uh, so uh, these people have these different theories, theories in Russia about how these work because they've been using, using them for so long. So long. Energy, Energy is taken, taken from hydrogen oxygen atoms. atoms. That's, That's quite, quite possible, with what I'll say later. And that announced the discovery of polarization waves. I don't even know what that is. Energy is taken away from the gravitational feed. I can buy that. Uh, torsional, uh, torsional fields, fields resulting in the energy taken, taken from the vacuum. The vacuum. I can I buy can that. that. You can't you buy that, that because you don't know about toroidal moments. moments. But I can but buy, I buy it. it. So, so others rely on the cavitation, cavitation when bubbles are formed, formed when water when twists. twists. So this so is this one is of the one devices, devices that they have. They have. So, to so to get around, around the cavitation, cavitation destruction of the matter, matter they, force they force pulses, pulses in here, here which, which produces, produces expansion, expansion cycles, cycles 500,000 per second, second in these for domestic home, home heaters. heaters. Has a COP of about, about 1. 1. 1.5, typically. typically. Um, um, and, and the cavitation, the cavitation occurs, occurs in the center of the channel, of the channel. so it doesn't so it contact the surface and, and the explosions the or the implosions go on over here. So it can work for a very long period of time without damaging anything. And the, and the interesting thing is, it's rare refraction pulses. pulses. And rare, rare refraction pulses, pulses, pulses will lead to solitons. Solitons are your yin yangs. yangs. They, they do work. work. It's not necessarily, not necessarily cavitation. cavitation. A method, a method, a method for this, this that's the pattern. pattern. Cop 1.5. So the so hydrowave technology, technology is an extension of this, which was which used to develop to destroy, destroy chemical, chemical weapons, weapons in the Soviet, Soviet Union. Union. Okay? okay? They needed they another use for it. They were running out of nasty stuff, right? So, so it, this, this is the device, device and it's Afsnaev and, and Pontov. Uh, there's uh, the device. device. These are the actual the devices, devices that were used for destroying uh, uh, biological, biological weapons, weapons. Um, uh, uh, chemical, uh, chemical weapons, weapons, and so on. And so, so um, basically, basically, you've got the reference down there. there. What they're saying is they, they managed, managed to reduce, reduce the amount of strontium-90, and they say credited this to weak interactions caused by the hydrowave action in the solution. And uh, uh, this uh, was confirmed by US by experts US in the field of technology. technology. And it was and recorded that there was an uh, unclassified uh, uh, distribution that you can download here. here. And I think many of you have actually read that and not, probably not clocked this work. They've just got like half a sentence credited to it, but it was a lot more that went on. So, response in the Russian community 15 years on was perhaps Kavov was right. So, so, a Mars vibrator. vibrator. He applied, he applied for a patent, patent July 27th, 2007. 2007. He, he applied, applied this around about 100 hertz vibration to water, to water for 100 hours, hours, and he had all the usual suspects elements synthesized in the water. And those, and those are the zero before and before afterwards. And Same thing, thing different researcher who had no clue that, that this had already been done in Russia. Russia. Uh, this uh, is his device. It vibrates, it vibrates like that, that's 10 times slow down. down. Metal, Metal plates, plates, plenty of opportunity, plenty of opportunity to, get to get standing waves, waves between these things and see exactly what you saw in that in-air system, system and exactly what you saw. And you can do for $35 with one cent uh, um, uh, uh, consumable, consumable with your with children. children. So, so this, this is, is one of the plates. plates. He said, I don't think there's cavitation going on. I said, just let me have a look at one of the plates. And one of his cut staff came up after two hours and had a look at it under the light and said, what are those cavitation spots? And, and they look they like this. this. You've got your yin-yangs, yin -yangs, and it also, also you've got you've torrids, torrids moving around, around carrying other ions. Isn't that interesting? That interesting. So uh, I, uh, I took, took one plate home. home. <laughs> George, George was, uh, was uh, putting, putting the tea, the tea on, on, and I, and I cranked, cranked up my microscope, which I got with a polarizing filter. I chose that because I imagined that if this is coherent matter and goes through the material, it will change the magnetic and the optical properties of the material. It was hilarious. I went like that. I can't see anything, can't see anything, but the polarizer, bang. There's, a, there's a, a spiral vortex track, like a strange radiation track, coming out of the center of a cavitation spot. So, uh, I looked at his, uh, there's a vortex pair, uh, it produces diamond, double diamond in the form of magnesium in a vortex, and, and chromium, in, which is quad diamond. Okay? And this is in one of the other experiments that we went and there.
Okay, okay. Um, he um, looked he at the Fukushima water in 2012, 2012 and they and radiated 137 cesium and 134 cesium. And, and after, after um, um, you can see the barium there, so it's a weak interaction. That's what they observed, uh, the change from 0.52 milligrams per liter to 3 milligrams per liter. And after 30 days, it's done about two half lives, I think, on the right hand there. So it works. Uh, there's uh, the clear, he, he produced all the elements, elements in the periodic table, table. Same, same system. system. So, so um, um, I, was I was looking, looking at something, something that inspired, that inspired uh, uh, Ken Shoulders to do his work, work that much of the Russian research, research, is, research is based on. This is a sample, I have it in my box, you can have a look at it. But I found four quantization levels of what Solin calls, which I didn't know at the time because I hadn't read his paper, but um, his pattern. But um, these, pa these uh, yin yang structures, and they're like uh, phallico solitons. They're just sometimes they're together and sometimes they're apart. And I've got them very small, 4D times with the rotation. The same structure rotated around here, and you can see the center bit coming through on the aluminium there, and this is viewing from the top. And then that goes on this structure, and it's got 48 segments around the outside. This structure is not spinning. It's spinning the spin aluminium nuclei around itself and the electrons, which are also spin. Okay, you don't want to see that. So this so is the this structure I published on the 17th of February, 2020. And, and this is what I want to know from uh, our string theory guy, if this is what he meant by 60 torus. Because you've got the 2D and the 2D and the 2D, right? And I thought that this was the structure of the physical vacuum. And um, uh, I later found out that it's the only possible structure of the physical vacuum from Russian research. But basically, it's a self-similar. And if you can imagine one of these subsegments to be a copy of the whole thing. You don't want to see that. Okay. okay. So, so this explains Bostick's D4D structures, structures that he published with Nardi in 1980. In 1980. So, so he actually yeah, specifically says D4D, D4D down, here, down here, and he and saw the impact marks, and they're and spoked. spoked. Of course, of course he was craking toroids, putting them over a magnetic field, field uh, and they were joining together into a toroid of toroids. It was only a two tor. What I showed was a three tor, but it was a fractal toroid. I was only doing the third degree because it doesn't really matter after that. Um, of course, um, John Archibald Wheeler, Wheeler, Wheeler kind of predicted this. this. Look, Look at what he says in his 1954 paper. paper. Regions of strong electric field strength, strength here, here, in a simple a toroidal gion of zero angular momentum, momentum. It's, it's not spinning! Not spinning. <laughs> uh, uh, two, two waves, waves of uh, uh, extreme strength, uh, of equal strength, run around the torus in opposite directions to produce a standing wave, with electric fields strong in the regions, indicating a magnetic field in between. The gravitational field, by this, By this disturbance, disturbance at the end, again, are, required are required to hold the disturbance together. together. I can't say it was right, it was 1954, but I think but it's pretty, pretty similar. similar. So, so, we've, we've seen, seen these structures, structures in abundance in different experiments. experiments. Here's, Here's one, a model of it, we'll see it there. So many times it's a boring. Frankly, here's another, here's another one, but this was a solid structure. structure. So the structures are neutral, they're vacuum currents. This has been calculated by the Russians in the 1980s and, and by the American Department of Energy in 2009. So they're, they're vacuum currents and um, they can take electrons and ions and wrap them around themselves. And so you sometimes get these, they tend to be calcium, these structures. There's another one, different level of fractal tor. There's a broken one and another broken one, and you can see it's a torus of tori, which would then be a tori. It's exactly what I predicted from Hutchison sample. Here's the first one that I found here by accident. I saw it on the train around home. I sent that to the Russians, and that started an amazing cascade of events. They threw in the towel. <laughs> and it ended up with this. Which is, a, which is an analog of the energetics research that they did. Um, and this is a, a four-tor, and according to uh, um, uh, Nevesky in his 1993 paper, peer-reviewed in the Electricity Russian Journal, this produces a vacuum current. It can capture 0 0.0 mg or any photons, uh, and a lot of other funky stuff, according to Freiberger, who says it can cause matter to fall apart. This is, oh, someone's suddenly made a coherent matter thing. It was so exciting back in 2020, 2021. We'd only been showing these things for, for years. But anyway, there we go. Right, so the other key structure is these triangles. So this is a break point. Iron behaves differently because it's ferromagnetic and these are magnetic charges. So they build up to a point where the metal breaks. I have this sample, you can look at it. 
and there's, there's nothing in the world that can stop the magnetic repulsion, it just twists. This is in aluminium, so you get a softer effect. This is in silicon dioxide, so you get a hard effect. And if you can imagine looking down the end of this, down the end of this, and down the end of that, which is, in my view, maximally a uh, golden ratio triangle, you see a spiral. This is in Maximoto's work in palladium deuterium, and he mo observed multiple of these triangles. Didn't quite know what they were, but this is gravity waves. He says they're gravity waves, and that's focusing the gravity waves. So, so Shishkin was, was asked, asked to make a, a uh, water oil, oil mixing device. device. This, is this is it. He turned it on and he felt extremely ill next to it. So he decided so he to put some x-rays on and he found these things called birdies, right? right? Some of them are called the mushrooms in, in Russia. But we've seen these in 3D in different experiments. But this is where this thing that can interact with the spin of the electron rips the electrons off the silver that's in the x-ray film and moves it around exposing it. But it also releases 5 to 10 kV uh, uh, electrons as well as these things disassemble and any ions that are being carried with it form pits. Um, and this is the key point here. Stream vortex solitons. These are the EVOs that Alexander Parkinov is lensing into a beta uh, sample. Okay? They are they natural are ones. ones. They, they are, are utterly ubiquitous. They are they coherent, coherent condensates through the entire universe. Now, now how do you make them? them? How do you make them? them? Well, well <laughs> I'll, tell I'll tell you how you make them. them. Anything, anything that you, that you know, know works in Lena. Anything. anything. The shocks, the pulses, the, the, the charges, the pressure waves, the solitons, whatever. But they have identified that these structures, these electromagnetic phantoms, which come when you when you take an atom, that you can knock out the core, you end up with electrons going off, so you get a lot of free electrons, and then you have a neutrino cluster, which was basically kept, kept the atom alive. It gets the neutrino flux from the universe, and it spins it out. It's a balance caused by the relationship between the electrons and the nucleus. And so you get this thing that comes out, and that can go back when the electrons join with the, uh, with the uh, proton or whatever it is, they can go back and they get their own neutrinos back. So you gain that mass, you gain that energy, okay? And here's the kicker. It's 2,000 to 4,000 times easier to produce these things with hydrogen isotopes. So the best thing you can possibly do is that. This is the magnetic moment, so just to show it, you have a magnetic moment uh, from an electric current. Here's what, Here's you've, what got you've got with Bostic, Bostic which is the toroidal moment. This is a toroidal M2, and this and is a, 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 something, something like I've got there. there. This, this is, is an anapole. anapole. The description of an anapole, anapole in 2016 is identical to the 1986 conclusion of uh, Ken Shoulders. You read those two, no time now. These are, this is a, um, a depending on the moments of the subtors, in the, in the uh, subtoroidal sub structure, uh, toroidal uh, moment. moment. You can you get, get a, a, um, a spindle spin torus. torus. This is in a, a Vega experiment of ours. And this is the inside part of the spindle torus, torus of another thing that blew up. And notice it's a crenellated, iron-rich spindle torus. So imagine the torus over intersects and you have the outside now on the inside. So you create what's called a lemon. So that's the apple whirling silently in space. Uh, that's the anapole, the anapole where it came from. from. So, so this is a paper from 2014, and they are actually exploring what they call hypertoroids. This is the official name in the West for them, for the people that are interested. And, and, and basically, depending on the, the level of your subtoral spin, you can end up producing tori, spindle tori, and that's up to a, an aspect ratio of 0.9. I imagine if you get to an aspect ratio of 1, like you do in ultra, in a few cycles, you get a sphere, which is hollow. And if you put an electric field across them, you have a, a, a bi-state, which is switchable, and they're looking at this in very little devices for your next generation computers. This is a real thing. It's out there, people are doing it for your next generation memory. Spin one way with the electric field, spin it out, and it's a stable state. So, spin night nuclei, aluminium, copper, silver, indium, and, and gold, they are moved or captured by the toroidal moment. We have experiments where we see no melting of the brass, but where these two counter rotating forces are, it's shifted the brass through the metal plate, out through the other side, and there's no pressure there. It's absolutely breathtaking. 
Magnetic, magnetic iron, iron and FeO2 stay, stay in the magnetic, magnetic core. core. That's what stays in the magnetic core. Non-spin spin synthesized elements uh, in the nuclei get ejected, and they tend to going around the torus that's making the core. And that's why you get these calcium and uh, um, tori. Uh, these, these are the elements the I would suggest, suggest which are good for fuel. fuel. Notice, I couldn't have got a better job with my indium. <laughs> it's like the best one on the table, by accident. <laughs> Um, um, and uh, uh, these are the erasures uh, uh, for, for your, your which, which you typically see in Lena Rausch, and, and you can see that the, the, the most, most, most of these things you see in Lena Rausch are actually uh, uh, non-spin nuclei. Back, Back at this, this image, image, we're wrapping, we're wrapping up, up now. This, this is, is on a zinc oxide plate. plate. This is a ball lightning that blew up in one of our Henkir and Zweig experiments. I managed to spot it. What do you have? At the core, you have your iron rich crenelated sphere. Around that, you have silicon dioxide, dioxide there, and there and there, and you have and you calcium oxide further, further out. out. And you get and a field of magnesium, magnesium and carbon and, and all the usual suspects like sodium and everything. And guess what? The principal the elements that the EDS picked up at that distance, distance from the sample were exactly the spectrum of the only spectrum of ball lightning ever published in physical review. And it's only recently by Chinese, they were trying to capture the spectrum of lightning. They caught the spectrum of ball lightning. It saw calcium, silicon, and iron. And this and is this exactly what we produce with the, the thing that we that found in the impact site of ball lightning, lightning in 2003 with Italian researchers, researchers. And, and we come through to this point. point. So there we go. Thank, Thank you to Francesco Cerrone uh, for, uh, having, for the having the courage to verify his technology. And, and uh, to Brian Hunt for doing the work. All of the mini experiments that have allowed us to look at them and test their claims without any restrictions. And thanks to Dave and him, especially the recent work over the last several years. Alan Goldwater, a big shout out to Alan. Thank you, man. I love you. All of the high active followers of the project and all of the very many donors in the project, which without, we would not be able to function. So thank you very much. Thank you for this explosive uh, presentation and uh, uh, just uh, one very fast question from uh, Jacques, please. Oh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Indeed, uh, it was hard to follow you because you speak fast, but mainly there is a lot and a lot and a lot of information. And it's impressive to see how much work is done in Russia because you read Russian and things like that. I, I took a small slice. Yeah, okay. But if we want to follow you, you, if we want to start to follow all that things uh, slowly, where would you suggest us to start? What kind of experiment, in a few words, as a first experiment, would you suggest to have something convincing to it's worth to try to follow you? So I would choose Matsumoto's uh, experiment that he did in 1996 that he shared with this ICCF, most of the people in this ICF group. Um, and he used a one millimeter lead wire, pure lead wire, in a folded pure copper box in a Petri dish with um, some uh, potassium hydroxide, so no carbon, in light water. He then used 120 volts because I think in 120, well, it's in here, extremely well described. But, so 120 volts, a few pulses, and then he found a hollow sphere of lead ejecting carbon. And we replicated this in at least two systems before we even knew of his work. Uh, oh, I haven't got it here, bad luck. <laughs> I have a, a, a one in, in the Vega experiments with the incredible crenelated sphere and out of it you're seeing silicon, carbon, all of the things that all of these people have said they saw and that's the basis of their ordered patterns. Okay. You are not... Uh, okay. One, maybe comment and, and question. Uh, you have presented... Uh, Plenty of different uh, phenomena, very interesting, uh, a lot of speculation. Uh, I, I, I mean, we live from speculation in physics, there is no problem, but finally we need some numbers. This uh, are missing. No, no, let me s to say something to, to the end. And roughly, if you have so many phenomena, you should have a, a kind of order. 
And the order I would see here is that the collective uh, um, uh, states, collective interactions. So there are two, th uh, the two problems. In the cold fusion, the problem is to come from the atomic scale of electron volts to mega electron volts. And in this uh, situation, you need uh, 10 to 6, 10 to 7 uh, particles or even more, no, maybe some billion of particles to, to be coherent, of course. Okay. See. <laughs> so this is something what we can uh, do, of course, but it's a speculation and you should show us how it works. Okay, there's one point. Another point, if you are speaking about cavitation and some uh, uh, so-called uh, magnetic monopoles, toroid uh, structures of electrons, this is well, well known, there is no problem. But uh, what is the problem? The, the you have not anymore the cold fusion, you have a hot fusion or uh, maybe... Is there any question? Because can I step in and answer things that you're asking? I there's a question, you, yeah. Oh, okay. So, no, if, if so it was not a monopole, why would it be a sphere? This uh, uh, magnetic, so-called, it's not really cosmic magnetic monopole, but it's this structure, the third structure was uh, published in Nature in the 19th, uh, so there's no problem that people study it. The problem is, however, uh, you should dis distinguish between hot and cold fusion. Because uh, if in uh, uh, some uh, experiments you can produce so in my high presentation, temperature, I high temperature okay. there's no problem, high temperature of, of even one million degrees. In the cavitation experiments of Los Alamos, there can were I, Can I address million. the cold part? Okay. This is conducted in water, one. Two, the uh, water is a completely the same different. So hold on, you hold on. presented so different phenomena with, which have no, nothing to do with each other, you know. Yes, so they have everything. They're exactly the same effect. There's one point. The in, another in point is something okay. different. If you are speaking about rare events, yeah, which is really rare and very difficult to construct, this is not help for cold fusion. Cold fusion should be working continuously and shouldn't be independent on, on some You are $35 things. and seven minutes away from finding out it works. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I have to close here the discussion. We can thank again uh, the speaker and uh, we have to proceed with uh, the, the speech of uh, Professor Grimshaw. about ENR research documentation. What have we learned so far? This is a very important question, by the way. Oh, sorry. Okay, let's check if everything has been restored. If you prefer, you can use the microphone. There. Perhaps I suggest you to use the other. Do okay. okay, I guess this is live. Wow, what a uh, how exciting to see somebody so so excited about his work. Uh, I have to say that uh, the enthusiasm is uh, is very infectious. Thank you. Um, I get th I have the pleasure of uh, giving you a presentation today uh, today on a program that I'm also very excited about and I'm having a lot of fun with. Uh, that's the uh, Re Leonard Research Documentation Initiative. It's about five years old now, so um, what have we learned so far? Well, the objectives have always been to capture records uh, from investigators and other interested parties in this field while they're still available. 
We are where we are, and a lot of records have already been lost, but uh, there are still plenty of opportunities for, for capturing records. Uh, to preserve these records where possible, for possible reanalysis as we learn more about the Leonard Field. Uh, what do these old results uh, mean, or if we can reanalyze them and reinterpret them uh, with the additional insights. And last but not least, I thank um, Ruby Carrot for referring to the uh, dedicated people in this uh, highly marginalized field for their uh, uh, continuation in the field. Uh, she refers to them as the Leonard heroes. So thank you, Ruby, for that. So uh, as I said, the uh, documentation, uh, the, the project is now uh, about five years old. It was first presented at ICCF 21 in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, currently, we have uh, 31 participants with three, uh, 20 different projects and uh, about 22 reports prepared so far. And here you can see the, I hope, you can see the, the list of people, starting with a pilot project that I'll talk about in just a moment with, with Ed Storms, and uh, then next with uh, uh, Tom Clater and Malcolm Fowler uh, in um, White Rock, New Mexico, then with, primarily with Dennis Pease, then later with um, uh, Ari, uh, Ari um, uh, and, and Graham Huber, I can't think of Ari's last name for some reason, uh, Dave Nagel, uh, Chino Srinivasan, Mel Miles, Peter Gluck, George Miley, Fran Tanzella, uh, Jean-Paul Biberian, I'll be visiting with him next week on this uh, uh, initiative, Ludwig Kowalski, Tom Passel, um, Fusion Facts, uh, Hal Fox, uh, uh, Abd Lomax, uh, Scott Little and his, uh, and his daughter at uh, Earth Tech, Marissa Little, um, and most recently, well, uh, and with Tanzella, we're trying to uh, document all of the work that was done at SRI International. Uh, and uh, most recently uh, with uh, uh, Francesco and uh, with Peter Hagelstein, just completed a, a project with Tom Dolan. So we've made a lot of progress. So what have we learned so far? Well, I should back up and say, well, uh, what, what have we learned so far? Uh, but first, you know, as I said, it started uh, as a pilot project with uh, Ed Storms. I'd been doing uh, some other things with Ed for quite some time, uh, going back to 2013. Um, and uh, that, uh, that work evolved into uh, a documentation of his extensive records. Uh, it's hosted now uh, by, the, uh, by my company, Lenergy LLC. Uh, at, uh, in my, this work is preceded by previous work that I've done uh, actually how I started in this field uh, with public policy analysis. Uh, I got a late, in, uh, late career degree in uh, um, a Master of Public Affairs at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at, at the University of Texas. Uh, and then it, that evolved into assistance to interested parties. I did uh, quite a bit of work with National Instruments. And so these two steps then evolved into the current LENR uh, research documentation project. Uh, here you can see some of the uh, hard copy records uh, from Dr. Storms. Uh, they, these records are now at the Marriott Library in, uh, in Utah, University of Utah in Salt Lake City, and I'll say more about that uh, later on here. So, five years later, what have we learned so far about the projects themselves? who's been participating, what are the records like, how do we do the preservation and archiving, what about the interviews that are being done in conjunction with all these projects, what's the status of the field, and what are the future opportunities uh, for this work. So starting with the projects, uh, as I mentioned, there's a, uh, this umbrella, the Lender Research Documentation uh, Initiative umbrella or program under which we do the individual projects. Uh, after I make contact with the uh, participant or the candidate, we set up a project under the umbrella. Uh, and then there's a, almost, uh, in most cases, a site visit uh, where two things are done. A, uh, uh, the records are collected and the interview, recorded interview, is, uh, is conducted. From that, uh, a timeline of research uh, is developed 
and the uh, arrangements are made for uh, preservation of the records and a report is developed. Uh, in that report, there are almost always more things that could be done that we can't get to, so I call that future opportunities. So that's, that's how, we work, uh, how the projects are done. That uh, method was worked out pretty much in the um, pilot project with Ed Storms, which was first uh, reported as a poster at ICCF 21. So we have this systematic procedure. Now, there are lots of variations. Uh, it's very flexible to meet the requirements or the situation with each of the uh, investigators. Uh, sometimes uh, it, it begins with an interview and then blossoms into a, a site visit uh, for uh, records collections and, and so forth. Uh, in, I shouldn't say that uh, site visits are essential, but they're very, very helpful. If we, even if we start with a, uh, an interview, at some point, it's hoped that we can get to that point for the hands-on record collection. Uh, interviews I found are really best conducted uh, in person because of the body language and you can kind of carry the, uh, the flow uh, wherever it leads you. It's very uh, spontaneous and it's almost always a lot of fun. Uh, just to recall it, in kind of date order uh, what the uh, participant, uh, uh, how, they were, how he or she was uh, involved in the field. Each time a piece of the puzzle is identified, whether it be electronic records or hard copy records, slap a cover memo onto it, uh, describing what it is, where it came from, and some of the other details. Uh, and then these uh, family of memos then become the uh, basis for the, uh, for the project report. Uh, re recently, uh, well, the, the uh, initiative really started with active investigators. Uh, but more recently, I've uh, moved to uh, extend it to other areas like the uh, fusion facts. Of course, Hal Fox passed away in 2012, uh, but he left behind a very nice legacy of uh, what was going on in the field from 1989 up until that time in his uh, fusion facts. So some of these projects now are not at, uh, are with uh, where the participant is no longer available. What have we learned about the participants? Well, this part of what makes this, this whole thing fun is the people I get to work with. Uh, I, and I look at, at, uh, at these individuals as researchers and as people and how they, uh, how they are in the projects. And of course, these things are, are interrelated. Um, but I, I, there are a number of uh, descriptors here, all very positive. Uh, they're competent, creative, dedicated, dr driven, conscientious, experienced, sometimes fractious, uh, and quite, quite, a very, uh, quite a bit of variability. Uh, sometimes they're secret, secretive because of intellectual property uh, concerns, and oftentimes they're open-minded, like in conferences like this, but then on the other hand, they're uh, often dedicated to their own understanding and, and, uh, and, uh, and how they feel about the, the, uh, the phenomenon of cold fusion or Leonard. As people, I've again uniformly found them to be very professional, honest, they're adventurous, almost by definition in this field, uh, very competitive, hardworking, uh, by and large very articulate, original, they're very personable, and also very opinionated, uh, and they're a lot of fun to work with, universally, and all the people I've, I've worked with. And as far as their participation in this program, uh, they're very supportive, cooperative, receptive, uh, very high integrity. They're very engaging, open, helpful, and enjoyable. Uh, so it's been, uh, the, un uh, the population has been almost uniformly very enjoyable to work with. Uh, here uh, in the picture, of course, you see uh, Graham Hubler, I've, who I've worked with on the Skinner documentation project, Ashraf Imam, and uh, of course, uh, Dave Nagel. At the, and this picture was taken in Dave's office in at the George Washington University. Some of the, uh, many of the participants have laboratories, of course not all of them, um, but in the labs uh, you have seen the, almost the entire gamut of methods of, of achieving uh, the effect. Electrolytic, of course, the granddaddy with uh, Fleischmann and Pons, uh, gas loading, gas, gas discharge, and several others including uh, solid state. 
Uh, also the full gamut of signatures, again the granddaddy being excess heat, but also nuclear signatures uh, such as the generation of tritium. Tom Clater, for example, that's been his specialty. Uh, low level ra radiation, I always say low level radiation to distinguish it between, or distinguish it from um, uh, dangerous levels of radiation. And then a variety of, uh, of facilities ranging from university labs to home labs. This is George Miley's Fusion Study Labs, Fusion Studies Lab at the University of Illinois in, um, in Urbana, Champaign-Urbana. Uh, that's a picture of Dave again. That's in his uh, lab at uh, George Washington University. Tom Clater has a, uh, a very nice laboratory with, an, uh, with a, a high overhead door. Uh, at his lab in White Rock, New Mexico. He calls his organization High Mesa Technology. And this is like in a, uh, in a uh, kind of a strip uh, construction area. And that ranges to uh, Dennis Slitt's very nice little home laboratory uh, in his backyard in, uh, right, right in Austin, Texas, where I live. And uh, I've, Dennis and I have lunch quite frequently. Unfortunately, uh, already we've lost four of the participants in, uh, in this initiative, uh, shown here, Charles Baudet, Peter Gluck, uh, Ludwig Kowalski, and uh, uh, Chino Srinivasan. What about the records themselves? Uh, the generally, of course, of two types, documents and data, or uh, hard copy and electronic records. And the main variables that I found in the uh, nature of the records is uh, the original type of data, uh, how it was collected, how it was recorded by the investigator, what media was used, again, by whether it was hard copy or electronic, how complete it was to begin with, how the methods, uh, how the records were kept, and then how they were retained and preserved after that. Uh, the uh, unfolding of the cold fusion or Leonard Field was almost simultaneous with um, the unfolding of the digital age. So we saw this huge transformation from, for example, manual records and, and hard copy notebooks to very sophisticated uh, uh, laboratory uh, uh, equipment and uh, particularly national instruments in its uh, lab view. This is a picture of Tom Passel. He just closed his laboratory in uh, uh, last month uh, in Mountain View. I had done a project with him previously and here his records are being boxed up for archive again at the uh, Marriott Library. Okay, uh, there are several categories. Uh, we always try to plumb the depths, if you will, of what an investigator or a participant has. What are the uh, publicly available publications and presentations as available on Jed Rothwell's uh, Leonard Kanner Library. Uh, what are the unpublished reports that might be in possession of the investigator? Uh, the electronic files, both current and legacy media. Uh, Ed Storms, for example, some of his information was still on the uh, three and a half inch floppy disks. Hard copy records, as, as I mentioned, uh, the type of laboratory, uh, the type of notebooks, uh, and then uh, always try to uh, uh, document too what are the uh, what kind of a library has the participant developed over the years? Uh, which of the ICCF journals, which, uh, or uh, proceedings, which of the uh, uh, journals of uh, condensed matter nuclear science, and what, what books have they collected? And of course, the, as a part of that, the conference proceedings. Uh, here we have a copy, uh, a picture from Dennis Pease of electronic files from the uh, Skinner Project in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, Dave Nagel has extensive hard copy files uh, he's been attending all of the uh, ICCF conference. He was acknowledged along with uh, uh, Francesco for attending all of the ICCF conferences at IC, uh, during the ICCF 24. Uh, this is, a, again, another picture of Letts' laboratory. And Mel Miles kept the most meticulous, detailed uh, notebooks of anybody I've ever seen, of any of the uh, participants. Uh, different solutions, of course, for the hard copy versus the electronic records. I think we made a lot of progress uh, for the hard copy records. I visited the University of Utah Library a year ago this past summer and did kind of a survey of what are their current holdings. Um, 
and uh, wrote a report on that. Uh, and their holdings uh, consist uh, of um, a lot of hard copy records. They have, uh, you, here's the, a picture of the, uh, of the uh, Marriott Library on the top, the reading room for special collections, very advanced, very sophisticated. Uh, and then the bottom is a, a picture of loading uh, Ed Storm's records, which took place last November, almost a year ago now, where I carried his hard copy records up to the, uh, up to the Marriott Library in Salt Lake City. Uh, not, not a one-day trip, especially with a U-Haul truck. So, uh, uh, so that's pretty much, I think, a pretty good solution. Um, uh, Ed Storms was, again, the pilot project for carrying his, his records that had been documented in, a, in a, the very first project. Uh, uh, more recently, Tom Passel, I showed you a picture of him with his records. They have also been shipped to, uh, to the Marriott Library. And Liz Rogers, who is now the, uh, the manager, has been very cooperative, very eager to help to get these records archived. Um, and I feel very fortunate to, to have, their, uh, have their cooperation. Don't yet have a solution for the uh, electronic records. Right now, they're residing on two hard disks in my, uh, in my possession. But I'm working with Rob Christian. Uh, who's in kind of a new introductory introductee to the field, attended ICCF 24, and is very interested, and he's very capable in this area, and uh, he's come up with uh, some ideas, and I think we'll be working on that over the next uh, few months. The interviews are a very important part of, the, uh, of each of the projects. It's like um, they're, they're complement, the, the interviews are like a complement to the records. And they're certainly necessary for developing that research timeline that I showed in the uh, diagram. Sometimes I do more than one, and sometimes um, uh, they're the first thing I do. And oftentimes, more recently, I found that the way to kick off a project is really to do the, uh, to do the interview. But the, uh, the transcribed interview serves as kind of the glue for the reports. How does it, how does it uh, hold everything together that was collected? Uh, in person, as I said previously, is, is much superior but uh, because of the body language and so forth. But it, they can also be done uh, over the phone where that's necessary. Um, the, um, then they're uh, transcribed with an online service and then the uh, transcript is provided to the participant for their review and, and correction as, as they see fit. These are some uh, apps that I've used successfully. Uh, when I do a, an in-person interview, there's a very nice uh, smart recorder uh, app that, that works very well, and uh, they have a very uh, quick turnaround uh, from, their, uh, uh, from the, the recording back to the, uh, to the digital file. Uh, when necessary, uh, and it has to be done by phone, I found tape a call to be very effective. And then when I get the, um, uh, the file, uh, the digital file, uh, I submitted to, a, a, I've used rev.com, but they've gotten quite a bit more expensive. I'm starting to look, look elsewhere. It costs a buck and a half a minute, uh, but it's very effective. And, and the uh, transcription is, is generally spot on uh, uh, for people um, uh, for which uh, English is the second language. Uh, if you specify which language the accent is, they're, they're also able to do quite well. What about the status of this field? Really, I have to say, I just confirmed what's pretty much already been known, uh, confirmation of, of, of what thing, where things are in this field. The rejection and marginalization going way back to that first year after the night, March 1989 announcement is almost a hallmark of the field. Uh, it's a, uh, I'll talk about the catch-22 situation, uh, but it's been really, I think, uh, Despite all the best efforts, we still are working on resolving the, the uh, interrelated issues of reproducibility and explanation. I mean, you know the classic catch-22, uh, you go to a funder or an agency and, and they ask for uh, funding. Well, you were rejected. You now have the evidence to, me, to assure me that funding is now warranted. Of course, you say, well, I need the funding to develop that evidence. Oh, sorry, if you don't have the evidence, we can't provide the funding. And so on and on it goes in uh, classic uh, James Heller uh, tradition. In, within the community, 
community, I think from the get-go, there's been kind of a circle of wagons culture, a lot of camaraderie and mutual respect. Um, the uh, type of people that are in, attracted to this field, either for research or uh, other interests, I think are kind of self-selected. Uh, uh, many types of people would not ever be attracted to this field. And I would say that the community is very loosely bonded and uh, sometimes with very fractious members. But there's still a lot of um, cohesion, I think, uh, within the cold fusion community. Uh, we've developed our own, or the community, I should say, has developed its standalone scientific processes and tools because of the uh, rejection by mainstream science. Uh, we have a full complement of tools, uh, uh, thanks to, um, uh, uh, to uh, Bill Collis. We have the ICMNS and the uh, Preparata Award. Uh, thank you, uh, Bill, for having new medals uh, struck for the Preparata Award. Um, we have our own conferences, uh, like the ICCF conference and this conference, uh, again, organized by uh, Bill Collis. Uh, John Paul uh, is the editor of, John Paul Biberian is the editor of the Journal of Condensed Matter Nuclear, Nuclear Science, affiliated with the ICMNS. Uh, Christy Fraser is the editor for Infinite Energy, our, the Fields Magazine. Uh, Jed Rothwell, of course, uh, has long had the uh, mastery of the uh, on online library, LeonardCanner.org. And then there's the, the always dynamic uh, online chat group, the, the Google, Google group. And that uh, Google group sometimes shows the more the fractious nature of the, uh, of the community. I think it's fair to say there's been variable and in, inconsistent funding over the years, spotty from government agencies, uh, generally from the private sector, uh, of two types, for-profit, ones that want to hit the home run, uh, and then the angel investors, perhaps like the Anthropocene Institute, that would like to uh, save the earth from global climate change and to provide a source of clean, uh, cheap energy. Much reliance in the field on uh, non-traditional sources. Uh, some signs uh, we see now of, uh, of more young people in the, in the field, uh, it's a uh, a, rec a widely recognized field that uh, as our uh, old timers, uh, sorry, uh, age out, uh, we really need to have people uh, uh, coming in behind and picking up the torch. What about the future opportunities uh, for, this, uh, for this endeavor, for this program? Seems to me like I'm just getting started, that uh, there are many more participants that uh, that may be approached than the ones, the 20 that I just listed under the umbrella. Uh, for each one, there's always been uh, future opportunities so we can go deeper uh, with each project. I think we have a good uh, solution for the permanent archive at the Marriott Library for the hard copy records, but hopefully working with Rob Christian, uh, we'll also be able to have uh, a repository for electronic records. And I should mention that two of the main objectives of the uh, electronic records uh, repository is number one, conf uh, security and confidentiality for the uh, participant, uh, and number two, easy access. Uh, it needs to be as easy to access and modify or add to as if it were, a, uh, say, a folder on your hard disk. There's also uh, on, uh, an outline for the, uh, an integrated report for, for all of these projects. Uh, outlining what, what's been achieved and what have we learned uh, to expand upon what I'm saying today uh, and to present all the, uh, the information that's been found. Need to have more emphasis uh, on uh, outreach and communications, especially in the public realm uh, and, and particularly outside the Leonard field. Uh, I also, uh, as a part of the in integrated report, you know, as I, I think I mentioned, that each project is confidential with the participant. Almost have to promise that in order to get uh, participation. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've got a very nice large collection of these reports. Now I want to massage them in a way and cycle back to the project, man, uh, to the participants, and ask for their permission to get their, uh, their reports into the uh, public realm. And then, of course, find ways to get the findings uh, of the very high quality people and, and, and uh, reports that have been done in this field. And, but most importantly, from my standpoint, how do we advance the Leonard cause? How can this effort improve the uh, prospects of Leonard? 
So in conclusion, uh, I think that Leonard realization is essential not only to this field and not only to the investigators here, but because of uh, global climate change in particular, it's, a, it's really uh, essential for the future of humanity. Uh, when cold fusion was first announced, I think in 1989, it was still fresh on the minds of everyone, uh, the uh, uh, energy shocks of the 1970s. Uh, and so I think the biggest promise at the time was, ah, we finally solved the energy problem. No more global energy shocks, no more being held hostage to, uh, uh, to energy supplies. But over the, uh, in recent years, in the last 10 years, I think we've seen a real shift uh, to, uh, uh, from the energy, uh, cold fusion or energy is an energy source to uh, a solution to the global climate change problem. It's clear to me that the loss of these research records that we're trying to mitigate is it would be a tragedy, not just for the individuals uh, or even for this field, uh, but, uh, for, but really for achieving Leonard. We've got to preserve these records to help to achieve this phenomenon and realize its benefits for the future of humankind, as I said. I think the objectives of this uh, field, uh, of this initiative, are being met. The methods, as you've seen, are pretty well established. A lot of records have already been preserved. Uh, got a long-term archive partly solved uh, after I'm no longer in the, in the scene. Uh, almost everyone I talk to tells me that they think uh, it's a good idea, it's universally accepted. And uh, you know, with the uh, uh, records preservation and the combination of the uh, interviews, uh, you know, I think is, is very powerful to have both of those. And the projects are fun. I enjoy, I enjoy doing them. I think the participants, uh, particularly during the interview, try to have those be fun. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're very supportive of the project. So, so that part of it, collecting the records uh, during the site visit is, is also fun. So I'd like to thank the uh, participants, of course, first and foremost, as well as some of their spouses. Uh, to, uh, part for participating in this uh, initiative. Uh, Carl Page and the Anthropocene Institute has been very uh, generous in supporting the effort through expense, uh, uh, helping with the expenses. Um, Christy Fraser of the New Energy Foundation and Infinite Energy Magazine has been very helpful, not only in uh, being a uh, nonprofit for uh, the funds, but also uh, as a venue for many of our, uh, the, the, uh, these projects in the uh, in her magazine, uh, Infinite Energy. Uh, Liz Rogers at the Marriott Library, thanks to her and her continued enthusiastic response and receipt of these uh, hard copy files. Uh, certainly Jed Rothwell, almost always start with a, uh, a survey of his li library, uh, see what he, his library has uh, for the uh, participant. And certainly to, um, to Ed Storms for being the project, not only for the entire initiative, but for being the first load of stuff to go to the Marriott Library. And thank you all for listening. Okay, thank you so much for this uh, talk and uh, for your effort that it is very much important in this thank you. conservation and activation program. Good. So the, the have talk a... is uh, open to discussion. Of Please, course. Please, Bob. <laughs> okay. Yes, Bob. Yeah, you, you mentioned early on that you had a problem uh, with the expenses going up on the transcription service. I can tell you two options, which I regularly use. Okay. One is kind of free. You upload the video or the audio clip with a null video to YouTube, and you wait ba basically a day, and then you use a program which you can get a free version of called 4K uh -huh. Downloader, and it, you can get it to download with an SRT, and you can use a program called Jubbler to edit that. Or you can actually edit the using the video or, or with the audio on YouTube and, and then change it. I'd actually recommend, if you want to go there, to pay about $25 a month on, on an Adobe Premiere license. And then you can do unlimited oh, transcription. Yeah. And, you, and it's quite quick. You put, you put the video or the audio onto the timeline. You hit the transcription. It, it pr produces it nicely separated. And then you can click on a thing that you see is obviously wrong, and it will step to that part in the timeline, and you can correct the, the English. It's really powerful. So I would prefer, you know, and it works on Mac and PC, so. Good. 
I'll uh, talk to you after, yeah, no, after this talk and uh, yeah, and, and those Thank you very, you. very much for doing this job. Um, my pleasure. As I already said, I'm having a lot of fun. <laughs> Bill? I'm curious to know how you managed to read three and a half inch floppies 20 years after they went out of date. Uh, would you please repeat the question? How do you manage to read three and a half inch floppy disks 20 years after they became effectively obsolete? How do I read? How do you read the, the floppy disks? You mentioned there was a problem with, I think, Ed Storms oh. is um, three and a half inch floppy disks. Okay. Disquettes. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble. Um, Oh, how do I read the floppy disk? Oh, that's a very good question. And even more is the uh, software that's used for the, uh, for the documents. He has one that I have not cracked the nut to this day on how to, uh, to read documents. I, it's not, it's, um, it was uh, Adobe, I think. It was a very early entry into the field of, of um, uh, word processing. And I have not yet been able to translate it. But uh, as far as the three and a half inch floppies and another, another one you often find are the zip disks, uh, the ones that were the big, big innovation. Well, first you had this, what was it, six and a quarter floppies, the, flo the real floppy floppies, and then you had the three and a half floppies. I haven't run across any of the th uh, six and a quarter, the Five real floppies, floppies, but I have the three and a half. And you can still get um, readers. In fact, you can buy them on... Uh, uh, on Amazon, I think, or, or certainly on eBay, uh, that will that will work, uh, and and also zip. Although the last of my zip drives uh, cratered, uh, but uh, and I haven't seen any actually zip drive since uh, or zip disk since since storms. So uh, so yeah, the uh, these old legacy uh, media readers in, and even software are still available, except for that one that I can't think of the name of that earliest one. I've got uh, a USB zip drive and a USB three and a half inch floppy drive. Should you ever need one? Yes, I have actually two of them, <laughs> and uh, they, they've proven to be uh, quite necessary. But really, with storms, uh, a few others, uh, but uh, uh, and some people have nothing but paper. Um, uh, so th there's quite a range of of how people, how quickly people adapted to the uh, digital age as as the digital age unfolded simultaneously with the uh, cold fusion field. Don't let me off so easy. <laughs> okay, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next speaker is uh, Emanuele Marano, and uh, I wish personally to thank him for the greatest support he have, has given during all this session, and today especially. <laughs> <laughs> Here. So, please present yourself. Yeah, thank you. No. I will okay. use this, I believe. Now I'm not able to start my presentation. <laughs> I'm joking. Here it is. Okay, so um, I will present Pullman's but real, reliable, real. Uh, I'm sorry for my English, it became worse when I am on stage. Uh, data acquisition system and a calorimeter for LNR experiments. Uh, I think it is most interesting for students and so on, but I don't see any student here. And, uh, oh, there is one. <laughs> well, so the purpose here is to uh, built as a solid, a reliable system with high precision, but uh, with a minimum budget. And uh, we will see how uh, I proceed. So, uh, in general, many LNR experiments need uh, custom-made devices in order to investigate for specific uh, effects or to trigger uh, something or so on. This approach has some advantage and drawbacks. The advantage are that uh, usually you can do whatever you want. Uh, mm, 
so many times you need to <laughs> build uh, a custom made devices. There are some drawbacks, for example, uh, uh, when you have to approach uh, the academic world uh, uh, sometime, uh, they don't understand well how the data is, was taken. For example, this is uh, instead a commercial calorimeter I used when I was at university, and all the people in the world can understand uh, how the, the data ca that comes from here. But however, uh, sometimes uh, it's mandatory to build a custom device because otherwise we cannot perform what you want. You cannot, uh, uh, for example, if I want to do an electro, electro migration experiment, I cannot use that. I cannot modify it. So, I will speak about uh, a data acquisition system and a Seabed calorimeter that I designed and realized, and I will show you the, um, the results. There is a, anyway, only preliminary test. I will not show real experimental results on real experiments. So, which were the requirements for a data acquisition system? It should be reliable, otherwise, in a waste of, fine, of time. It should have a, um, a high precision. It, ideally, 24 bits is a very good value. Just to remind you, uh, this is the precision you have uh, with this amount of bits. If you have eight bits, as many data acquisition system, for example, many Arduino boards or um, others, you can measure up to one unit over 256. This means this value in the one to zero range, for example, if you are, can measure only from zero to one volts, you can have a precision of 0 0.004 volts. And these are the values for other mm, amount of bits. 24 bits, uh, if you have this value, you have a lot of uh, precision. But anyway, also less is, uh, is okay. Uh, you, so, a high number of, ch of channels may be a good thing if you want to, for example, parallelize and make uh, uh, many di experiments on the same time in order to save time, to uh, have uh, an higher statistics, uh, and so on. So it is a good idea. It can, should be able to accept a wide uh, voltage range inputs, low and high, for example, and negative and positive, maybe. And if it has a low cost, it is also good because usually the, such a system costs cost uh, thousands of dollars, so it's not uh, accessible to many people. Uh, so, let's have a look. Uh, ah, yeah. Yesterday, so the way was uh, that uh, only professional and expensive uh, devices were able uh, to be found. And they're expensive, and only some professional lab has, that, has them. Today, there are some many boards like uh, Arduino, like uh, others, uh, Termino, and so on, that can be accessible for low cost because the microprocessor here uh, that sometimes can have a high precision uh, is not so expensive. So, uh, and some people that uh, assemble the design, the, the board, make it public so you can built uh, or it is a, a low cost one. Uh, this is for example LabJack, some one of you may know. It is uh, an already ready system. It costs a few hundreds of uh, euros, but uh, it has no software, so I have to write it and it's not uh, so easy. Uh, Arduino is also used, uh, for example, Ubaldo use it. Um, the precision may be variable, usually eight or 16 bits. So I will I use the Termino system and I will show you something about what is this. Some of you already may know. It is a system of uh, hardware, open hardware and open source applications that uh, you can use for basically whatever <laughs> you can think about. Um, there are some people that are uh, electronic engineering that um, um, design, build, test it, uh, and make a variable available online. 
Uh, and you can buy the board, it is not so expensive, it's just uh, $20. Is this one. It is just an input-output board. And you, uh, by attaching other uh, devices, you can, for example, if you attach this device called ADC 24-bit, you can increase the precision to 24 bits, okay? And it has uh, 16 channels. So this is a really good uh, thing. Um, okay, what's supposed to? Uh, these are some ac typical application, some of the application of the terminal system. It is used, for example, in some industrial um, companies to, in this case, uh, make some measurement on the bottles here. It, has a, it is used for CNC purposes uh, in geology for measuring seismic wave. This is a seismometer with three axis uh, uh, sensors. Uh, many of you may know it's only because uh, he, there is a nice software to measure radiations and make the spectrum from um, scintillators. Or you can play also music uh, by testing, um, by pressing on um, lemons. <laughs> okay, so this is the main board for my data acquisition system. It is, uh, this is the, the actual one. I put them some filters directly near the, um, the input, uh, some capacitors just to filter much, uh, as much as possible the noise because I want to measure only DC signals. And, uh, and I don't want to use uh, so much expensive, I cannot use so much expensive cables with some I mean, uh, screen cable, unfortunately. And uh, this is the general scheme for the data acquisition system. So, these are the boards you, see, you saw, and these are the experimental cells. Uh, up to 16 cells can be put here in parallel, and every cell has to have many signals to be measured. Some are voltage signals, some are temperature signals, current signal, signals. So this is the part that usually is missing, so the interface between uh, the duck and the experimental cell. So um, I designed, I have to design this stuff, and I included some multiplexers that are some devices that from one channel here, you can read up to 16, for example, channels. So you multiply 16 per 16 is uh, up to 256 channels in general. And uh, how to realize this stuff? Because usually you pay for um, custom boards and so on. So first, I try to make a prototype on a breadboard, this one, <laughs> and just as a, as a proof of, of uh, ComSet. This is the, the these are the multiplexer boards, and these are the voltage dividers to select. Uh, for example, it can measure up to 100 volt. Uh, where is with this divider? Uh, even if the input is uh, only up to 3.3 volt, it can it can measure also negative voltages with uh, some special arrangement. Okay, but uh, of course this is not good for uh, the real experiment because you have uh, the system is so precise that. Uh, um, you can see the connections, uh, the touching and attaching. <laughs> Uh, they're not so, they're not soldered. So, but there is this today, in recent years, some uh, uh, service online that uh, you can uh, use for printing your own PCBs, and they are very um, convenient. I was surprised about it. So you design your board, this is not mine, but this is just an example of one, and it is, is, uh, there are software that uh, you, you choose just a part, it's very easy to do. I learned, I used uh, the time for me for learning was about one to two days. And uh, these, these are uh, the real boards built in professional way. The interface board, some can measure voltages, some uh, can measure the temperature, RTDs, and so on. And this is the prototype of the data acquisition system. 
Uh, you can see here uh, there are all the possible connections. This is a mess, but um, it is a prototype. Okay, and the software. <laughs> this is the problem sometimes. Because uh, you should have a lot of skills for writing software, or sometimes the software that, that is pro provided to you is not, uh, has not all the features you want. In the recent year, in the recent year, I mean a couple of years, uh, the, the team, the Terimino team, developed a software called Terimino Automation that, uh, with a simple language, that uh, you don't have to know programming language, just a few things like uh, the cycles, four cycles, and so on, variables, huh? and so on. I mean, but it is very powerful because with a few rows you can command command uh, power supply and so on. Uh, it took me one, two, three days, depending uh, for writing, for example, a complete software for controlling a, um, a power supply when, as I want. And this is, for example, the data acquisition system. It uh, can choose the cell among eight cell log data to the disk, uh, set some parameters, uh, and so on. And this is the complete uh, <laughs> software, um, data acquisition system. There is, you can also choose to have, for example, a relay board. You can turn on and off. Uh, you can have some safety systems that, uh, with some sensors, automatically switch off the experiment if something is wrong, and so on. And it was an easy time. Uh, if I had to use a classical uh, programming languages like C++ or so on, it would be, it would be impossible for me. Uh, it would be take too long time and uh, too much knowledge. So, so you have a system. It uh, you can read some number numbers, but you have to calibrate it in order so for this number to have a sense. And uh, usually this is uh, an expensive task because you need a voltage stable, precise voltage reference. And there is, but there is an integrated circuit called LM399 that uh, has a declared um, precision of uh, one per 1,000 volt and a voltage drift, a thermal drift of uh, 0.5 ppm per degree centigrade. So. You have some very stable voltages here. You can select by these jumpers. And uh, you are provided already uh, someone measure first for you, and you have the exact value for your board. You can find it uh, easily on the internet. And with this, I calibrate the system. And these are some of the results, just to show you the precision that was important for me. And uh, here you see two different voltage divi dividers. One, you see the numbers here. It is, uh, it, these are two channels, different channels, and they fluctuate over a time of about uh, half an hour uh, of a minimum values. And uh, it can measure up to 6.6 .6 volts in this case. And the precision, the measured precision is about 16 bits, so it's good. With another divider, I had uh, another um, higher preci per precision. You can see the values here are very near each other. And uh, I suspected that uh, the data acquisition system is more precise than this. I believe uh, these are the fluctuation due to the supply, not to the data acquisition system. Okay, so now I wanted to perform some calorimetric experiments uh, with uh, electro migration to replicate uh, an experiment. And uh, I have it to build a uh, calorimeter. So I choose the Seebeck one because I think it is easier. Every time you have to manage with heat, it's not a good, uh, uh, easy task. And um, these are my requirements that are, I think, common to many people. It should have a high sensitivity, of course, otherwise I cannot see <laughs> any effect. It, it can, uh, he have to, must have a small volume just because 
uh, I, um, I don't have so many reagents, so I need a small volume. A fast timing constant is preferable. That means it's very fast because you can see, um, you can understand more. Usually, calorimeters are very slow. And uh, should be, of course, easy to build, manage, and permits this type of experiments and possibly low cost. So, I make before a simulation in order to see if uh, my design should, can work or not with the material, materials that are available. And these were the steps. You design the calorimeter, you choose the materials, you simulate the system, you optimize it, and verify that uh, the sensitivity meet what you had in mind. So this is a transverse scheme of the calorimeter. I will explain you something. Uh, it is an electrolytic cell. Here there is the electrolytic solution with uh, a cathode in the central part. And uh, the wall, external wall of graphite, can act as a anode. Or you can cover the wall with uh, another substance, for example, if you don't want to pollute the cell, for example. Um, so this is the cell. We have to measure the heat from here. Uh, I choose graphite because it can conduct well electricity as well as heat. So the heat, heat transfer to the wall here is very fast because the conductivity is fast. Uh, the transducer, transducer is uh, an thermoelectric module placed there. That they can be one or two, depending on the sensitivity you want. And of course, an aluminum water block that uh, because you need a stable, very stable temperature here as a reference, otherwise the data are, have no sense. And uh, all the other walls, the heat cannot have not to escape possibly for the other um, from the other walls. So there is uh, you need a very good uh, insulator. I choose uh, the best I, for, I can able was able to find aerosol fibers. And there is a cheap version with a declared very good uh, coefi uh, thermal coefficient, uh, thermal conductivity coefficient. So, would it work? Let's see. These are just the mesh field I used to simulate in simulation. And uh, this is the temperature field. You see just here that, okay, you can, will generate the heat here. This part will be warm. This, will, this part will be, uh, of course, cold because you, there is the water here passing through. This is the temperature profiles uh, given uh, along this line. You see here the materials. And I simulated it for different, uh, different heat fluxes in order to see the behavior. And uh, the temperature drop here, you cannot see, but there is a temperature drop here along the thermoelectric module. This gives you the signal that is proportional to the electromagnetic the electric signals. In literature, these type of cells are cheap one and are very, very well characterized. There are a lot of papers. So you can find uh, the conversion between temperature and uh, the voltage signals signal detects it and uh, you can compute uh, the sensitivity. This is instead the heat flow, heat flow um, graph. And you see the flow is forced to pass through the thermoelectric module because here there are some insulator and uh, theoretically it should be good enough. It is concentrated here. You should not uh, have uh, so many loss of um, um, sensitivity. And is, here it is the, the profile. Basically, you want the, the heat uh, flow value here on the thermoelectric module to be as high as possible. OK, and so these are the simulated results. Uh, I simulated in four cases. And uh, if you have a single thermoelectric generator, as here, or a double, uh, one over, um, over the other, and uh, because I didn't know the thermal conductivity of this stuff, I wasn't able to find it. I simulated two values, different values, 
uh, and uh, see after if they are correct or not. And these are the values of the sensitivity, and uh, they are good enough. You have uh, up to 250 millivolts per watt. So the data acquisition system is precise, so you can easily measure fraction of watts. And these are uh, the practical uh, um, devices. Uh, here there are three in different phases of construction. Here the graphite blocks that were manufactured in order to have some holes and so on. And uh, yeah, these are the same in other stages. This is the water block. And these are some of the results. You can see um, here there is the applied power in. Uh, and here there is uh, the Seberg voltage. And you see, uh, this, is very, this is good. Uh, the power signal is very stable. The data acquisition can read it very well. The Seberg signal is noisier than I thought, but with some smoothing can be uh, uh, can be more precise, but anyway. And uh, this is, was a dummy test with a nickel wire. And uh, the time constant was measured uh, between 9 to 20 minutes, so it's very fast. You change the power and it reached uh, steady state uh, also on the output signal you know, in fa um, fast. And the sensitivity was uh, this one, 142, in this case, millivolt per watt. And this is very good. It agrees, as you see, this is the four, four points, the sense in the slope, and it can be placed here in this region. So I'm happy about this. So in conclusion, <laughs> this is shorter than the others. An high precision and high numbers of channel uh, duct system can be built at low cost if you have some skills, of course, but not so special. A student can have it, can have them. Uh, PCB can be designed and obtained uh, with uh, cheap online services, very cheap, uh, but at professional level. Custom software is easy to write with this new uh, application. And uh, you can do whatever you want with the software. You can write whatever you need. And um, it should be uh, OK for uh, the type of experiment I, I, should, uh, I want to do. And uh, regarding the calorimeter, so it, was, uh, it is fast. It has a low volume. It should be also suitable. And the real device sensitivity is in agreement with the simulation. But I didn't mention it before. Of course, a good temperature stabilization of the water block and also the uh, surrounding is needed in order to obtain some reliable result. This is an important part. Otherwise, uh, you lose the precision you have. And uh, if you provide these requirements, I'm working on that, uh, you should be able to perform some very nice experiments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, I think at, at the end of your talk, you mentioned what is a real problem is the room temperature variations, you know. And maybe you can simulate that by changing the temperature and see the, the effect on the output uh, of signal. I have already done it. Oh, good. <laughs> That's fast. I like that. Yeah, for example, you see, I tested, uh, for example, uh, which is the level of precision you, uh, you must have on the thermal bath. 0 0.5 degrees are not sufficient. You need to go to at least 0 0.1. And you can see some, yes, thermal instabilities due to this effect. Uh, but I already have a solution, so I have no time to, I have not the results here, but um, I, I find a way. I will just close the each, each cell, cell in um, another, uh, let's say, yes, box, let's say, insulated box, and control that temperature. Hmm. Another question? How much is the total cost? 
for typical experiment uh, in euro. <laughs> Much of the cost, of course, is the time I spend. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> but <laughs> but this, uh, the young people, it's okay. <laughs> so if you have some, <clears throat> the calorimeter can cost for a single calorimeter, of course. You have no. to buy bigger quantities oh, some okay, type of stuff. The uh, control system. Can all, be, huh? all the control system. The the control system. Maybe 150 euros, something like that. That's very good. Yeah. Thanks. And the time uh, for uh, developing? Woman time. <laughs> Student. <laughs> Uh, it was uh, yes a lot that was the expensive part I think also because <laughs> I I have to I had to learn many knowledge uh, uh, while building it so it was uh, it was a lot <laughs> some month more, months or more yes but now uh, that I can I know I can do it uh, very fast but uh, of course beginning I spent uh, yes okay a lot of thank work. you. Uh, Hi. Uh, I have very general questions. Uh, if you look at the low energy nuclear reaction problem, we try to, we try to uh, correlate the temperature uh, or heat excess and the fusion product measurement. So uh, in your data acquisition system, is there any possibility to add the particle uh, detection data acquisition, acquisition system along with the temperature or not? So let's see if I understand. There is two different data acquisition system. One is the particle data acquisition system, another is your, your calorimetry data acquisition system. Uh, so we can make some kind of interface uh, if you go by uh, or not. No, not exactly. The data acquisition system is, uh, was built to measure the calorimeter outputs. So the calorimeter outputs goes in the, go in the that acquisition systems, the temperature, the voltages, currents, and so on. So uh, my suggestion is that if you look at the temperature, you know, the so you can create the digitizer. Uh, in, uh, right now in the market, so many good digitizer is available. So if you, uh, uh, in some uh, very precise uh, temperature gradient, you know, an ADC digitizer is there. So if you convert that temperature uh, into digitizer and make a, uh, some correlation with the uh, uh, some counts, either it's neutron or yeah, something like that. So, it, it, it is, is it possible? So, you are uh, m m telling if uh, I can measure the temperature as, and also the yeah. particles? Yeah. Okay. The particles, not now, but uh, it is planned in the future. The temperature, of course, there is a sensor, temperature sensor inside the cell, one outside and so on, of course. Okay, thank you. Mm. Right. Okay. okay, if there are no more questions, we can uh, conclude here the session and uh, we, we leave the stage to Bill for his final uh, consideration and uh, talk. So. Uh, Thank you to all the speakers. Well, <coughs> that's the end of the technical sessions. A little bit of an administration now. <coughs> but I'm not saying goodbye because this afternoon we have a an excursion, and this evening we have the dinner, of course. Okay, is that better? Um, so administration first. Um, most people are going to be leaving tomorrow, I guess. And uh, you must leave your room empty of your, of your luggage at 10 o'clock in the morning. But if you uh, are not leaving immediately, there's no reason why you shouldn't ask reception to leave your luggage in, a, in their uh, luggage deposit room, shall we say. And that, uh, that should solve the problem.
Talking about leaving, um, a minibus is being organized to go directly to the airport sometime tomorrow morning. And there's a, a message out, uh, put up outside on the notice board asking you to add your name and your desired time to be at the airport so we can try and coordinate that. I think there are some four, four names up there already. The, the minibus can only take seven people, uh, plus your luggage. So uh, take advantage of this. It'll get you to the airport pretty quickly and conveniently. Rome, Fiumicino. I'll take you to uh, Perugia, okay. Uh, if, you already, if you need uh, invoices or certificates of attendance, you can ask me now and I will print them out for you. Or if you uh, don't want them immediately or you only think about it later, you can just email me and uh, I will e email the, um, the certificates back to you and you can print them yourself. Uh, a few words about future meetings because uh, we want to meet again, don't we? Um, RNBE 2022 will be held in Paris um, in a, really in about two months' time. This is a French meeting organized by Jacques Rouet, I think. ICCF 25, uh, as you already heard, will be in Poland. Uh, this was decided by the International Organ uh, Advisory Committee back in uh, uh, Colorado, or Colorado, California in July. It will be chaired by Konrad Czerski, and you're already familiar with the, uh, the Polish group of, who have been making such excellent reports here at this, this workshop. As for the next workshop, um, I, I don't want to go into competition with uh, ICCF 25 to have two very similar workshops in the same continent, that is to say Europe, is probably not a good idea. So I would guess it would be held in 2024. Um, so this afternoon the program is <clears throat> after lunch at 14.30, when in the past a session has begun, we'll have the group photograph on the steps. I'm hoping uh, you, Bob, will be able to uh, take the pictures as you have a nice tripod. Thank you very much. Uh, at 1500, Rita, whom you already know because she's behind the reception desk in the hotel, and she speaks quite good English, will give you a guided tour of the Basilica and the nearby uh, museum. And then tonight at uh, 20 hundred, at eight o'clock that is, uh, maybe a little bit earlier, um, you can make our way to the uh, Sala Perfetta Letizia. That's the, uh, the, the room upstairs with the lovely green murals. And uh, we'll have the banquet. Uh, the, the banquet menu has already been put on the notice board. And I would advise those who are vegetarians that the, the, uh, the text in green is a vegetarian dish. And there are quite a few of them. So I think if, if you're not eating um, meat, I think you'll still be able to uh, enjoy yourself. Uh, at the banquet, there will be the award of the Giuliana Preparata Medal. Uh, as you've heard, we've just minted another 25 of them. So, so, I think by the time we've run out of metals, uh, most of us will no longer be alive. <laughs> Fortunately, we managed to pay quite a good price for this because we were reusing the old artwork, which we, was paid for um, in the 90s, in, the, oh, in 2004, I think it was, ne nearly, nearly 20 years ago anyway. And um, so that's brought down the cost quite a lot. I thought it was going to be more, in fact. The, um, the new medals are slightly heavier, so they actually look even better than the old ones. And the old ones were pretty, pretty nice. So uh, you, you'll learn about who's going to, the, who, who will be uh, awarded the medal at the dinner. And I hope Claudio is going to present the medal. Is he here? Uh, he's probably not. He might chicken out, I don't know. So now at the end of the conference, we have a few minutes, I believe, uh, so we can, I can open the floor again to, uh, to general discussion. Here are some of my ideas, um, but it's really up to you. You can talk about anything you like, how to improve the conference, what kind of experiments we should be doing. Is calorimetry really relevant anymore? How can we foster collaboration between various groups? How can we identify the underlying processes of the phenomena we're trying to study? These are vast questions of 
of course, I, I dare say we, could, we can raise the issues now and discuss over lunch. So, would anyone like to say anything? Yes, Jean-Paul. Yes, point one, we should do gas, gas phase experiments instead of electrochemistry because there are a lot more application in gas phase than there is in electrochemistry. It's hard to do uh, application with electrochemistry. Is there any point in doing calorimetry? Yes, because if you want to correlate with nuclear measurements, you have to make sure there is a lot of heat first, because if there's no heat, there will be no, me no nuclear measurements either. So, I mean, if you have nuclear measurements and no heat, I'm really worried, you know. Anyway, um, how can we identify the processes? It will take another century. And how can different groups collaborate? In Europe, we're already collaborating, but we can always increase this collaboration. That's my point. I wouldn't be worried about making nuclear measurements and not getting any heat, because from the nuclear measurements, in theory, you can calculate the heat independently anyway. And because the calorimetric uh, heat might also be due to non-nuclear, uh, but due to chemistry, it's actually a little bit uh, confusing, I think. Anyway, um, the nice thing about the nuclear measurements is that they can be done in real time, whereas calorimetry has a long time constant associated with it. And so you could see instantly, within a few microseconds perhaps, of stimulating your, your system, and lo and behold, you get some, some, nu yeah, some neutral particles. We particle. see nothing. We see, zero. we see zero. So it's easy to see zero. If you don't know if your equipment is working, you don't, if, if you've seen no nuclear measurement, no neutron, no gamma, no whatever, what do you conclude? You, you conclude that your underlying process does not produce gammas, neutrons, and the rest. Exactly. <laughs> That's so that, that is why you need we theory, which predicts exactly these things. <laughs> but if you don't know if the experiment works, how can you make nuclear measurements? Because, I mean, I can measure anything. There's nothing. It doesn't prove anything. I have to make sure there's something going on before doing that. Uh, Conrad. Okay. Uh, can I talk? Uh, I was, oh, I was, sorry, I I was shaking okay, myself a lot. Uh, so thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, rebound on, on the collaboration in Europe. And uh, as an insider, I want, just wanted to say that I was, um, at the beginning, I was a skeptic about the possibility of, of a productive, working, effective uh, group. And um, so I, I can testify about it. It, it actually works. Um, we have uh, people from all across the different countries in Europe uh, having regular meeting. I can talk about the material preparation, especially that is conducted by uh, Christophe Leroux here. And um, uh, people are open-minded, sharing ideas, sharing documents, sharing papers, sharing, sharing their experience. Um, there is a lot of exchange of, uh, of samples. Uh, there is a lot of... Uh, the collaboration works, the framework that Europe uh, binds us to use to be able to, 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 to justify the work uh, is effective. It, it actually works. So I can testify from inside, yeah. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. It's nice to, to see someone justifying uh, uh, the, the collaboration. I, the, the, the expected results I would like to see is the, the use one. of uh, expensive equipment in one laboratory, and you can share samples to get analyzed in these different laboratories. You avoid, you avoid um, duplication of doing the same experiments or the same measurements uselessly, because you're all collaborating and you will publish eventually the, uh, your, your results. So I think this is an extremely efficient way of using public money. Okay, I, well, can I speak? Okay, so uh, I would like to come back to, Jean, to, to that Jean-Paul said before so about measurements. So in my uh, opinion, there is um, usually you have um, uh, nuclear reactions can take place even at room temperature. The cold fusion conditions, there is something special. We need additional enhancement and excess heat is something that 
define the cold fusion. But uh, without this uh, special conditions, we should measure as well something. So this is not, not the case. And um, the point is that we don't need to measure directly uh, nuclear products. We can measure something else that are, those are produced by nuclear reactions. So example is for that, uh, that uh, what was made by the Professor Kasagi in Japan he measured just a photon distribution. That is a nuclear product. It's not a nuclear product, it's a secondary product. Nuclear product, it is uh, charged particles produced in nuclear reactions. And photons that can, can be produced, they are multiplied. There are many photons for one uh, charged particle produced. So you see automatically much more events and uh, uh, the efficiency of for measurements of photons is uh, pretty high. You can produce uh, larger cameras or uh, photosensitive uh, detectors, and that can help. This is one example for that. Yeah? Another point, if you want to measure gammas, uh, specific gammas uh, produced in some reactions, uh, it is also not so easy, but in the case we discussed here, electrons, you can measure instead of electrons, high energy electrons, which is also not so easy. You can measure probably Bremsstrahlung. You produce many gammas, low energy gammas, instead of high energy one photon, and then you ha we, see, we see something else. What is necessary between uh, secondary products and the primary products, some simulations based on uh, known physics. It is Jean Faure uh, tool that can be used. You have all the important physical phenomena included there, and you can combine your measurements, your observation, with the primary uh, source of, of the effect. Well, whether the, uh, the effects you're observing are primary or secondary, they are nevertheless going to be real-time, which is precisely the point of making real-time measurements rather than the, the long time constant of calorimetry. This is the, these are the two cases I want to distinguish. And we know that uh, photons, regardless of what their wavelengths are, are coming from some, for some, nuclear, um, some nuclear phenomenon. So I, I think um, the, the distinction between primary and secondary is, is not particularly important. Yes, Bob. a full disclosure agreement, um, and if he has the time uh, to conduct SEM EDX analysis and uh, for gratis or extremely low. Um, for those people that want to hold things back, they would have to speak to him uh, separately. Um, I'd like to be able to do the same thing. I have a couple of sponsors. I'm about two-thirds of the way there to get a um, second hand. It's, 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 it's a showroom model that I've been using the last year. If that's the case, I'd like to offer the same thing to independent researchers and whoever else on this side of the pond uh, um, uh, on the same kind of basis where you have to be open about what you're doing. Um, the About detectors, yes, like you were right in saying you haven't got those things going on, but you might have other things going on. Now, you can choose not to look for these other things and believe that they don't exist, but they certainly do exist in certain, many experiments. So the most simple one that I've seen that, I, if anyone's interested, is the use of uh, certain types of NP-junction diodes. And you look, look at the um, change in the forward bias that occurs when, when these structures get into the uh, NP-junction. It actually changes. This is why it messes up electronics. Um, the other thing is, um, I, I didn't get to talk about shielding, uh, about this radiation. If you're never going to have a successful end of experiment, you don't need to worry about having shielding. Um, but because you don't get the normal type of radiation, which you know how already to shield for this. But uh, um, the, Ru the Russians came up with a, and they've tested it with live creatures <laughs> and seen the benefits of the shielding. But I can, very simply, it's using uh, uh, latex rubber. 
and silver, because silver excites because of its um, spin and because of its high electron conductivity, the black EVOs, the string vortex solitons in Schistian termin terminology. And they get then excited and then they use either zinc sulfate or a, a similar strontium aluminate uh, photo um, phosphor. And so just like it causes fake um, gamma and x-rays in scintillators and fake neutrons and fake th this radiation, uh, it can genuinely harm you. And so, like I say, if you don't have a successful experiment, don't need to worry about it. But if you have a successful experiment, you need to consider having this type of shielding. Um, and uh, it's very simple, and you can paint it on once you've made the mixture. So you buy silver powder, zinc sulfate, or strontium aluminate, and I think one other compound. But it's on my blog, and you can go and see I've done the Russian translation. And they've also tested it with... Um, uh, um, granite for people who live in areas of um, high natural radon flux or whatever, because this natural radiation will produce these 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 structures also. So there we go. Okay. I think we can just continue this discussion over lunch. So those who are interested can do that. Just hi, one hi. more slide, though, please. Hi, Bill. Uh, I have last questions. I am here. Okay. So. Uh, I have. I want to make just one comment uh, regarding that. Uh, what in the very much in same line what uh, Konar uh, speaks. Uh, secondary photons. So, for example, it's uh, right now. If you look the physics list packages for the simulations, simulations, and uh, even the particle trackings is very well defined. I can say very well, very well defined. And uh, for example, uh, I will take uh, dark matter weak interacting mass massive particles so giant 4 is also doing the same things uh, I'll very uh, you, you can find the very good articles um, um, in physics uh, general physics uh, in any any general physics but uh, secondary photons always play a very crucial role to uh, differentiate uh, underlying the physics process uh, uh, which we can't uh, 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 direct understand uh, from your direct measurement so okay. i think yeah. we better we'll close down the discussion now otherwise okay. we're going to upset the the staff in the restaurant i just want to say a big thank you to alberto asia and claudio not not to mention 12 patrons of the the workshop we've never had so many I think Claudia, Claudia is to be thanked for, for recruiting some of them. Uh, and also you, Alan. Thank you very much. There you go. Long show. Alan, if you need the, mm -hmm. the technique uh, for the interview, yes. you must call the hour in the afternoon. Okay. okay. You can use that. Yeah. Uh, are, are you yeah. interviewing? I, I, I was okay. just going to mention to everybody that we, I've set up this private members area on Menar Forum oh. instead of the Google group. Good for collaboration. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. That's all right. Yeah. That's all right. Uh, you, you can make an announcement. Yes, do it now. Yes. <laughs> sorry, if I, if I could just have your attention um, <laughs> for one moment. I don't want to come between you and lunch. On Lenar Forum, uh, some two years ago, in memory of Norman Cook, I set up an area that's now known as a private members club. This is not visible to ordinary forum members at all. It is by invitation only and was always meant for serious scientists. So if anybody would like to use this, because it's not so combative as the Google group, which is often the space for people to have arguments in and not much else, but in the interest of collaboration, um, just join Lenar Forum, let me know, you'll find me via Lenar Forum very easily, and I'll, get, I'll upgrade your membership to the private members club, which is very quiet at the moment, too quiet, but anyway, have a lovely lunch. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Uh, it was perfect. If I were here, you cannot I use know, the but you know what?
No, but the, the next it week, was very good. You must. Yes. The, 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 so I, well, we know how it we know how it works. The last, the no, no, we know how it works. It's fine. Um, certainly. Uh, well. Right. Huh? Um, you you will tell. <laughs> but we, we know how to do it. To put, uh, we know how to do it. To put the, the, the last. Oh, that one. In this okay. way, you okay. don't just run to the, the, the meeting. Okay. All right. I'll just or grab a picture of me with people. that slide. Do you want to uh, <coughs> on the stage? I, I understand. Yeah. Somewhere around here, pretending that I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I need to move because your slide is. You want you and and your slide. Did I take my memory stick? Why? I didn't but, uh, see one here. Okay, okay. go. Yeah. I'll find it. Uh, I'll find it. You should have. Yeah. yeah. 